Hey everyone, I'm Julie Gunlock, your host for another episode of the Bespoke Parenting Hour. For those new to the program, this podcast is focused on how parents should custom tailor their parenting style to fit what's best for their families, themselves, and most importantly, their kids. So I've talked a bit about my own experience with parenting on this podcast, obviously. Mostly, though, I focused on education, but that's only because this podcast launched in September 2020, which was the height of the pandemic shutdown. And really, at that time, the main parenting issue was closed schools. I I think it still is, frankly. Since then, we've seen a lot of communities stand up grassroots advocacy organizations to pressure schools to open up. These groups are all over the country. Many exist in the Washington, D.C. area, some more successful than others, some more aggressive than others. But these groups are made up of parents and actually teachers who are angry that their kids are still at home or that from the teacher's perspective that they can't get back into the classroom to teach kids face-to-face. These parent-led groups have become powerful advocacy groups representing kids, parents, and even a few teachers as they interface with school officials, the people who are actually keeping the schools closed, to try to push their school districts to in a particular direction. If what I've just described sounds familiar, it should. I just described what the PTA is supposed to do. For those listening to this podcast who aren't familiar with what a PTA is or does, the PTA is a membership organization that stands for Parent Teacher Association, and it serves as a liaison between parents and teachers and school administrators, like superintendents and school boards. The PTA is supposed to advocate on behalf of both teachers and parents, but because it is a parent organization, they really are there to represent parents and the interests of the children being educated in the schools. Yet during the pandemic, PTAs have been oddly quiet. In fact, the national PTA has pretty much been absent from the conversation entirely. Why is that? Why the silence? Where are the PTAs? So here to talk to me about this is Luke Rosiak. He is a journalist with the Daily Wire's new investigative reporting team, which is heavily focused on K-12 through education. And he also operates whatarethelearning.com. It is a website where parents can learn about indoctrination in schools, but can also report problems with their own school districts. He lives in Fairfax County, Virginia, with his wife and two daughters. Recently, Luke wrote a piece for the Daily Wire called How the PTA Sold Out Parents for Politics During School's Biggest Crisis. Luke, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. So uh, I, I, I got to ask, you you and I live very close to one another. I, of course, have mentioned on this podcast quite often. I live in Alexandria, Virginia, right outside of Washington. Do you actually have kids in the public school? No, they're too young to go. Ah, uh, lucky you. <laughs> I guess no one, no one has kids in public school in Fairfax, really, or hasn't for a year, but my kids are too young either way. Oh, good, good. Well, that is that is good because it. I think it has been trying on parents um, who had kids in the public school. Many parents are, are, are leaving the public schools. My husband and I have pulled our two remaining children out of public schools. So, um, you know, I, I, I think I think the answer to that question uh, will increasingly be no after this year. But let's get into your article. Your article covers two issues, really. First, the PTA silence on the issue of opening schools. And second, the PTA becoming more politically active. And I, I don't think this is a recent thing. They have been becoming more and more politically active for years. And of course, when I say politically active, I don't mean on both sides. It's usually, you know, it's, it's just leftist causes. So let's cover the first point. In the article, you say the PTA has essentially been absent from the public debate on reopening schools. Why is that? And, you know, if you want to summarize what you found in that article. Sure. So, I mean, if you think about all the outrage and all the discussion about getting kids back in school, you read these articles and you would think that, you know, there would be a quote from the PTA. You've never heard the PTA say anything. And if you pour through their website, they're talking about all kinds of unrelated stuff like we should pass a bill about dressers turning over so they don't tip, o- tip over our children. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> um, you know, they're not talking about like, you know, schools, we haven't had them in a year. Um, yeah. And, and so you pour through their website and you can see they put out like two statements that are like the first one said something like the PGA believes that the discussion about reopening schools should involve a variety of stakeholders and we should go back only when it's safe and with enough funding. So it doesn't really say anything. It's just nonsense. It's word salad. Um, it, yeah. Uh, I mean, obviously there should be a, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a waste of time. I mean, uh, we should inv involve everyone in the discussions. Like, okay, that, that's yeah. meaningless. Um, they eventually basically said they opposed reopening schools in July when President Trump uh, was pressuring states to reopen. Um, they said, you know, the, the president should not be brazenly making these decisions. Um, so they, you know, they basically opposed reopening schools. And then more recently, they've said, you know, only when it's safe and with enough funding. So they never really define what safe is. And the one thing they know for sure is we need more funding, which is the same line as the teachers union. Well, what I well, the, it's interesting. I was going to take another. I was going to go in a different direction, but you mentioned the teachers' unions. I have found also that the PTAs, and and I know you addressed this also in your article, are parroting what the teachers' unions are saying. I, I, do do the PTAs not see themselves as independent? I mean, it seems like they just see themselves as a almost an arm of the public school administration now. When did this start happening? What is the cause of this? What is the leadership of the PTA that now they, they there's no daylight between, you know, sort of what the official uh, school and union, I mean, <laughs> I repeat myself, uh, position is and the PTA, do they not see themselves? I mean, where did the P go, right? Where did the P and PTA go? Right. And why is there a T in there? Um, yeah. You know, I, I, and I actually did a th three articles on the PTA, part of a series. And the third one uh, is called Teachers Union Honchos Infiltrate the PTA. And so what I did there is take the tax filings of unions and the tax filings of PTAs and match them up. And there's wow. a ton of union officials who are board members on the PTA and vice versa. Um, and, and so they literally are the same people. Um, you know, there's a lady and I have a picture in the article and she's like a board member of the national NEA board representing Colorado. She's also vice president of the Colorado PTA. And so she's wearing her same red union, red blazer on the website of both of those organizations, pushing the exact same message, which is give more money to schools. And it's just really a striking visual, um, cause you can't tell which group she's representing when. Right. And, you know, the article just goes through and I, I didn't, couldn't even put them all in. There's just a ton of examples um, from big to small, national to local. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, these are I, I think that the pandemic in a lot of ways has woken up people to yeah. existing issues with schools. And I think that's really important for people to understand people who have never really thought about these issues before. And now they're really concerned and they really want to get their kids back in school. Um, this is really a symptom, what we saw in the last year, more than anything. And some of the causes that we've seen, some of the, the problems are long-term problems that are going to, that have been in place for a long time and will be even after uh, people get back in school. And I think the PTA has probably always functioned as an adjunct of um, not only teachers, but really to the school. Yeah. And, and so, you know, there's like three interest groups around schools, right? Parents, teachers, and then school administrators. And so you've got the, the parents and the teachers in one group. You might think, well, okay, they're advocating against the administrators in some way. That's not the case. They've actually got multiple people who are administrators on the national PTA board. Right. And so if the PTA is representing teachers and administrators, you know, what constituency are they advocating for? I mean, it's, it's, it really is just an adjunct of the school apparatus. And basically the P is in there. I think of it as controlled opposition. So if you're a parent that is wanting to get, wanting to get involved in your kid's education, you, you have the initiative to kind of do something. You say, where, where should I apply my energy? They say, oh, well, come over here. We'll tell you what to do. And they give you a little mission that's something like, um, you know, bake some cupcakes for the teachers or sell right. some wrapping paper. Right. And, that is not what, you know, uh, involvement in our children's, what, what our children do for eight hours a day. That's not what involvement in education is. And it's, it's almost absurd to think that that should be 
the extent of parents' involvement in their kids' education. And, and, and that's kind of what everyone knows about the PTA going back decades, right? You go to the little bake sales yeah. and yeah. there's a lot of problems with the schools. Our educational, you know, the, the test scores, the NAEP scores have been going down. Um, funding is going up, but without any, you know, measurable results to show for it. There's a lot of big problems with schools. And the idea that we would sit around uh, just baking cupcakes and planning parties is, is frankly kind of striking. Well, it's so funny that you say that because I was in charge of a potluck dinner. That was my big thing at, at in the PTA. I was a member of the PTA and I was the, the, the one who sort of developed and organized this P, this potluck. I helped with the bake sale. I helped with the, um, the teacher appreciation lunch and the teacher appreciation letter, you know, dinners. I would, drop off covered dishes. I mean, I was cooking all the time <laughs> for the PTA. That was really the extent to... And it's super you know, kind of demeaning. Really, it when you yeah, it it's, it's, it's so funny that you say that. I never really thought about it, but literally I was, I was in the kitchen when I was helping with the PTA. Now, I will tell you, when I um, complained, uh, we had a, a couple years ago, right after Trump was elected, there was a teacher walkout. And it was all related to the the recent Trump election. And the teachers walked out and so many teachers walked out that the entire Alexandria school district had to close down. And it was very unexpected. So there wasn't child care available. There wasn't for for parents, you know, parents were kind of scrambling, trying to figure out, you know, what they were going to do. It was really awful. And I remember when I objected to that and I I objected by putting a um, a sign for a fundraiser for a school fundraiser in my garbage can because I was so mad. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to raise money for this school that does a walkout at the last minute. I got fired from my PTA position. <laughs> I actually, actually, I will tell you, my, being fired from the PTA from a voluntary position at the PTA was is sort of a point of pride for me. But it was my, it was uh, apparently I didn't re- even realize I wasn't allowed to do that. I didn't know. And here, I i mean, I had a definite reason to be angry about a teacher walkout that inconvenienced thousands of families and left kids vulnerable for the day and also not learning. And so when I objected, they, they actually fired me. So I was kind of shocked at that. And it was a real wake up call. You know, it was sort of my, I think it was my second or third year um, of having kids in the public schools. And it was a real wake up call to what I was dealing with that I was supposed to shut up and go along and bake cookies and make casseroles and not really object or get involved in any serious issues. So it is kind of interesting what the PTA has become, which is essentially a bake sale. And and that's that's upsetting because I think you make a good point that there are so many important issues and I think even more important issues now uh, before schools and before public schools. But that's sort of the reason why some of these grassroots groups have cropped up during, you know, since the closures of schools. And, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about that when parents don't have anywhere to go. In other words, the PTA was not talking about the continued school closures so parents didn't have anywhere to go. And I mean, I see that as the reason why these open school groups, these sort of grassroots groups cropped up. Do you see that as, I mean, just sort of the dearth of advocacy for parents is why these, these, I mean, there are thousands of these groups all over the country. Um, yeah, of course. They were completely abandoned by the PTA, which was the natural place for this kind of parent-led advocacy. And that's why you see this grassroots uh, movement now. And, you know, we have to hope that it sustains even after the coronavirus passes, because clearly, I mean, this is in Washington, they have a trade association or an interest group for everything. You yeah. know, this, you, you can see some of the most obscure examples of little industries that have their own presence in Washington. And here we as, you know, the parents of children, which is basically the biggest and broadest uh, constituency you can think of. We literally don't even have a singular advocacy group focused on our interests. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the volunteers who lead PTAs. You know, I, 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 I hate to sort of, you know, say, oh, every, you know, the, the, cause there is a national PTA, but then there are all these individual chapters. And, you know, one thing that it really bothers me too, is the, la- I mean, the willingness of sort of the local leadership, the local PTA leadership to sort of keep quiet, right? Like not, don't look at the curriculum. Don't, don't, you know, talk about the testing scores, you know, or the scoring or, you know, are we passing, you know, this, you know, 
standards of learning. Like n- nobody wants, you know, are our teachers trained correctly? You know, I, you know, the problems with restorative justice, you name it. Like they don't want to, you know, the PTA isn't going to talk about that stuff. Um, you know, but I think about the local folks. What is the fear? Um, is it fear of retribution that their kids won't do well if they speak up about these issues? The the sort of local leadership also fascinates me, not just the national leadership. Did you talk to anybody, any local PTA presidents or leaders, and did they talk about any reticence to, to speak out? So the national PTA didn't even get back to me for this story. Um, you know, later on, I went on TV to talk about it, and they gave a, a, a statement to the TV station, which was, you know, the PTA continues to advocate for teachers and all families. And so even in their denial that they were yeah. prioritizing teachers, they literally put teachers before parents uh, and <laughs> families. Um, but, you know, the issue with getting involved locally, I go around and around on that issue a lot because on one hand, it, it may be past the point of salvaging and it could be really frustrating to try to get involved in a huge, you know, waste of time where you're really spinning your wheels and, and exerting great energy kind of swimming upstream just to accomplish um, very little. I wonder if it's better just to start over with some of these organic groups. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there these are low turnout elections it is conceivable that you could kind of run as a slate and, and really pack however the wherever they take these votes ensure that regular parents show up for once yeah and vote for actual parents that actually want to watchdog the schools um maybe you could kind of win a, a, a like a, a full slate and, and just kind of take over all at once but i think it would be very frustrating dealing with these kind of people that like who fired you um, you know, it's a lot of drama and, you know, what we need to do, like you said, there's, it's so crazy to me that, you know, we spend, uh, probably more than a trillion dollars a year this year with all the stimulus funding, but normally yeah. it's about 800 billion a year on schools. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of scrutiny. What would any board do if you were on a corporate board, you'd be pouring over all the problems you'd be you know, auditing it. And, and the idea that no one in the PTA would ever do such a thing is, um, it needs a wholesale change that it's never had before, and, and I don't know that it can because of that T in, in the PTA. I mean, teachers' unions have their own group, and, you know, if we were to – they say, well, you know, the PTA thinks we're natural allies. Parents and teachers are natural allies. What they mean by that is parents' job is to serve teachers. That's right. Um, if, if you or I were to show up at a, a teachers' union event – and say, so, well, you know, I think we should get kids back in school. And they say, Why, what are you doing here? Well, I think parents and teachers are natural allies. So I showed up at the teachers' union meeting. <laughs> you know, they'd throw you out. They'd laugh at you. <laughs> they'd fire me. Yes, I know. <laughs> so let's shift a little bit to the activist role of the PTA that they are now playing. It really is shocking. Your article is so thorough. And I want you to talk a little bit about this legislative conference. Um, I... I found this also amusing. And, and frankly, this is something, you know, I'm sort of in the field with you. Like I, I also, I don't, I, I, I cover K through 12 and in, in, as just sort of as my own experience with it and out of curiosity, it's not actually the policy issue that I focus on full time, but it is amazing. I've been, you know, obviously I have kids in school, so I've been watching this for, uh, for, you know, a few years and it, but it really is shocking you talk about this legislative conference that the national PTA held in March. Okay, so what what kind of issues, what topics were covered there? Was it school closures? <laughs> so school closures are nowhere on the agenda. If you go through the first day, the session is empowering parents to mitigate the adverse impacts of climate change. <laughs> and then from there, they go on to their next session, which is supportive and inclusive practices for equity. And then after that is Courageous Conversations in Diversity, where attendees will analyze the critical role of PTAs in developing diversity initiatives in your school buildings, in PTA units, and in communities. And and so this is kind of how I first got into this, and that's my first article in the three-part series uh, was down in Florida, an elementary school was having um, the PTA was basically doing racial sessions on parents to try to make them, you know, 
believe in kind of some of these newest racial things where it's very bad to be colorblind and you have to be thinking about the role of oppression in every interaction and even more radical things like that. You're supposed to think that minorities will always be late all the time because that's part of their culture. Right, that one of right. The things they said. Um, really pretty crazy stuff. And, and so the PTA was saying, we're going to gather all the parents together and we're going to have an activist group that was paid by the school system's equity office to come change the beliefs of parents. And so this was really striking to a lot of parents because they were like, we thought the PTA represented us. Now they're like right. basically using, conducting an experiment on us. And instead of getting to your, what you said earlier, which is I think the key point here is that the PTA is an adjunct of the schools, not a watchdog of them. Right. So this, the tax, the schools that we fund, you know, we pay for this bureaucratic office called the equity office in this Florida school system. They were fun. They hired an activist group yes. to, you know, basically manipulate the views of parents. And, you know, I have the contract where they, they, they paid for it. And they said, this is, this is for you to operate on parents who just happen to live near our school. And so they've been doing this, you know, pushing these views. The schools have been pushing a lot of, they're, they're very obsessed with a race in a way that I think is concerning yeah. because you don't want kids to be anxious all the time. You want kids to be happy. And um, we really don't need to highlight the negative in every situation. The kids have a lot to learn about all kinds of different things. They don't need to be focused on race all the time. And that's kind of what schools have been doing recently. And now oh. the next step, and I, I phrase it kind of cheekily in the, in the headline of my article, I said, with children fully indoctrinated, uh, schools have a new target, parents. Um, yes. And so they're, they're moving on to the adults now, and the teachers yeah. somehow think it's their role to change our views about politics. Yes. And in this case, the PGA was serving as the vehicle for literally members of the school administration to conduct experiments on um, adults. Yeah. And so after writing that article, I realized that they were very much, this local PTA in Florida was very much executing on a mandate that had been given to them by the PTA nationally. And that conference kind of made that crystal clear that the, and there's, they wrote a letter to the Biden administration in, in, right. Um, right before he took office that said, basically, that's one of the things that we're going to do is, is use our PTAs to push, quote, equity views on the parents not just kids. So, it, you know, that's what the PTA has become is if you, if you care about your kids' education, show up here. We're going to tell you do not, whatever you do, do not look at the operations of the schools, and we're going to try to change your beliefs on behalf of the school administration. Well, you also were very good about sort of outlining, outlining some of their positions. Uh, the national PTA is anti gun they are anti-vouchers, they're anti-charter school, they're pro-critical race theory, they are for co-ed bathrooms in schools. Um, I, I, I didn't find anything on this, but I assume um, they'll come out with some sort of statement being pro-biological men competing in women's sports. Um, I, and again, I, I don't know for sure. Do you, do you, have they come out with a position on that? I, I haven't seen such a statement, but that your prediction strikes me as correct. Yeah. And it's, I think, it's important to say that there was polling done on all these issues before, right before they took these positions, that shows pretty clearly that you know, parents didn't want um, you know girls in in their boy, you know, boys in their girls' locker rooms and things yes. like that. And right, like overwhelming majorities of parents of school children, there's polls specifically on this issue. And then right after that, the PTA goes to Congress and says, speaking on behalf of our right. parents group, right. we want you to do this thing. Um, vouchers, overwhelmingly, um, parents of both political parties and of all races, strong majorities want um, you know, the option to go to charter schools or to use that money earmarked right now for the kids' education to, for private schools in some cases. And the PTA um, advocates against that. They even advocate against little things like tax breaks for if you buy school supplies yeah. for your kids. You know, some people say well, you should be able to write that off on their taxes. And this is for public school. If you want to write yeah. off their, you know, their pencils and paper or whatever, the PTA is against that. And, and it's kind of inconceivable to think that parents approached the PTA and said, I'd like to make sure you don't, you know, please make sure that I don't get a small tax break. Um, that's, that's just not possible that actual parents ask for this. And, right, of course. and I think the same is for the racial stuff. I mean, if you go to the PTA's website, it, it says the parents should read 
a book called Your Five Year Old is Racist. Let me oh. get that title right, but it's something um yeah. it's something to that effect. Your your five year old is already racist. It it is inconceivable that parents said you know, PTA, as a group that represents me, could you please berate my young child and tell him that he hates uh, minorities? Yeah. Um, you know, like no one ever said that. It, it, and, and frankly, some of this stuff is really um, damaging to kids. I think parents have a protective inter in, uh, interest where parents don't very much don't want their kids accused of things. Um, our eight-year-olds are not racist, and they shouldn't be told that by government institutions. And, well, and you know, and, when and, you think and, of the, the concept... And the other, the other really important thing here, though, is that the critical race theory, you know, if we're talking about Abraham X. Kendi or if we're talking about Beverly D'Angelo, who is really making a ton of money off her grift, the, the saddest part, though, is that it conveys a message to children, um, to, to uh, you know, children, um, uh, you know, black and brown children that they're living in a horrible racist country that there's no chance of it ever um, changing and that they, because of, by virtue of, of, of their skin color will forever, um, you know, be limited in, and they won't have the ability to, you know, realize the American dream. That is to me the most horrible thing. Of course, I don't want a, a you know, a, a, a you know, five-year-old white child told that he's racist, but I think the most really tragic part of this is telling children of color that they live in a, Hopeless, right. helpless, and, and, and they're you know, helpless. To, I think we all know that there are literally, probably, probably, say if you use the word literally or close to it, no minorities going to the PTA and asking them to do this. Right. This is entirely driven by rich white women yes. who, in some cases, pay, um, you know, black women. And, and let me, and let me pull up the quote from um, this one they hired in um, in Florida. It says, "I'm a masculine performing Hindu." Uh, lesbian and you know it's just this kind of crazy person that makes a lot of money kind of yeah. basically going saying my identity is who I am my race and my gender and my sexual orientation that is who I am as a person well, there's nothing more to it um, well, Luke, so, I was you know, I was really I was really grateful to whatarethelearning.com. I really urge people to check out whatarethelearning.com because it is really interesting. And I looked up Alexandria. Alexandria, Virginia, ACPS, uh, is listed there, and there is a um, a training manual that is absolutely terrifying. It's pure critical race theory, telling people that they're racist by virtue of immutable qual you know qualities like the, the that just if they're if they're white, they're they're racist no matter what, and that. You know, you should always, you know, check your privilege when talking about these issues. And I love the I love the bullet that says, like, you know, be willing to have uncomfortable conversations. They don't want to have conversations. They don't want to have no, any they, conversations. They do want they do want your children to be uncomfortable. And yes. you're right. I mean, it's one of these things where when you hear when people hear us talk about it, they think we're exaggerating. Oh, That's, no. You're not exaggerating. I've seen that document. It is absolutely oh. shocking that anyone would think it was even legal to do the things that they have in that in that book. Um and that's kind of why I made what are you learning dot com is number right. one to get parents involved. There's this idea that hopefully someone else will come save me or I'm not really an activist. I'm a normal person. It's someone else right. is better positioned or I've got some reason and everyone has a reason. Oh, I'm going to work for the federal government. So I'm not allowed, which is total BS. Everyone yep. is trying to come up with some excuse why right. someone else, they're very unhappy. They know what's going on is bad for their kids and it's wrong and it's crazy, but they're just hoping someone else is going to do it. No one else is going to do it. That's right. the point is these, right. these districts are small and local there's no national, the national, no national group can save you because it's local. So if you don't step up, no one is. And so the way that this website functions is you can just upload stuff anonymously. And then you, of course you can see what others in your community have uploaded. Um, but I think taking that first step of at least underscoring, we're asking something of you. If, if you're, if you're, if you have an issue, you've got to play a role in the solution. That's an important uh, thing. And then the other thing is just to see it with your own eyes because the way they talk oh. about these things, yeah. they're very good at marketing and it's based on people's apathy and they're, they're, the fact that they're busy and they don't really, they've trusted the schools. So they'll say, oh, well, we want to make everyone care about inclusion and being tolerant of everyone and being nice. And of course we all support that. But then you like, you read the actual documents 
that doesn't remotely characterize what's really going on. Um, yeah. And so you've got to you've got to drill down and see it for yourself because you you cannot trust the schools. The marketing is is just that. Well, you also can't trust the PTA anymore, and I know that's your point. It's the deception is something that's really bothered me. And my community in Alexandria, the PTA leadership, which is under a name called PTAC, and it's like the PTA Council. Um, those the the people who run that. Um, this, so they're like, um, it's a count, council, if you think of an umbrella, and then the individual school PTAs are beneath it. That PTA council leadership is drenched in liberal philosophy, and, 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 and they are all for all of the policies that are being pushed by the national PTA. And, and when I want to just go back to the deception issue, you know, last year, my town CP. PTA had a so-called safety conference, right? It was just to talk about school safety. It was co-hosted by Moms Demand Action. It was only focused on gun issues. It was only to push the idea that we need more restrictive gun laws. But this was what was so creepy. And I actually wrote about this for NRA magazine that they wanted, they actually did a role play activity where you, as a mom, you, your child is invited over to someone's house and you first have to say, well, do you have any guns in the house? And are those guns proper? Now I am not against people asking that question, but it was a way really to convey to people in the community that if you do say yes to that, if, cause nobody, they don't really care about the safety, the guns being locked up. They want to know who has the guns and it's a way of right. kind and of, and it also has nothing to do with school. It has, and it has nothing to do with school safety. And so they want to, they want to kind of send a message to women that if you have guns in your house, your kids are going to suffer because they're not going to have any play dates and they're going to, their friends aren't going to come over. And it's really almost like a monitoring or a tracking. It was, to me, it was, a, it was very weird. And to see the PTA right. again, again, partnering with a political, I mean, an extreme political organization. Yeah. Like and the, the president elect of the national PTA is a woman named Anna King, whose background is mom's demand action. Yep. That's where she got into her advocacy. That's how she got this job. Um, yep. and, and so, you know, they, the PTA supports, you know, the, the ban on assault rifles um, nationally. You know, so this isn't anything school specific. It's just um, full. Uh, a quote ban on military style semi uh, semi automatic assault weapons yeah. you know for for everyone um and so uh, this is a position that doesn't really have much to do with schools but then meanwhile um you know they're not saying anything about the school closures and they're willing to but they're willing you know basically you're well, representing so, a pretty broad constituency yeah, and they're, so and if, they're, if half the country is conservative and half of parents are too and they don't care and i mean well, and, if you're on a corporate they, board they they so they care so much about safety and ch- and child safety and yet we know kids are committing suicide we know kids are are, are committing self harm we know kids are struggling psychologically we know kids are falling behind educationally which will lead to future harms and nobody's talking about that so you know the idea that they'll take these strong positions on things like gun control but they won't say hey 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 could you open the schools because it's a child safety issue too is I think what's so galling to to the parents who are watching this. Yeah, and it really, I mean, their big thing is just more funding for schools no matter right. what. And the truth is our schools are not underfunded. We spend about $16,000 yep. a year per, per child. Yep. Um, and so if you think that most people have about two kids, you're basically talking about we're spending the entire median income of a family just on their education. Yep. Um, you know, how could you even spend more? And I mean, where is the money going? You think about a class of 25 times 16,000, that's a lot of money. It's not just going to the teacher's salary. Um, and I think one of the reasons the PTA is always trying to make you sell sell wrapping paper and things like that, it's not actually to raise the money. It's to convey the message that the reason we have to do these degrading things is because schools are underfunded, which it, is the teacher's yeah, union's message. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I, I honestly, Luke, I, th- I feel like I could go on for, I, I have so many more questions, but I, I don't want to... Um, I I do have to cut this short at some point, but I I have one other question. You know, I live in Alexandria, Virginia. This is, this is Alexandria city. It is a deep, deep, dark blue town. Do you think to some degree, part of the reason that the PTA has lurched so far to the left? And again, this is not new. It's been, 
that's been sort of lefty for a long time. But do you think that to some degree is that the, it's location? I don't even think, I don't think they should be here. They should be in like Wichita. Like what is your feelings on, because look, I, I live among deep, dark blue voters. <laughs> I mean, what, I just feel like they probably just don't understand where, uh, you know, a whole half of a uh, segment of America, how they think. I, I think that's right. I mean, even I think that the new the president is from like somewhere in the southwest. And, you know, even when they find people in, in these conservative states, it's the liberals that they choose. But, yeah, it, the PTA National Board is, is, is heavily loaded with people in the D.C. metropolitan area. Um, I, I don't think it should be based here, but um, I think another problem is for people that show up at the local level, no matter what the political characteristics of your community are, because um, there's really no such thing as sort of radical centrism. Um, in other words, you know, people who hold strong beliefs, they usually are, are you know, uh, the people who take the time to go to all these events and seek these positions are people who have some strong viewpoint. And in the, in the past, it hasn't been just a strong desire to, like, make your school run well. So there is some asymmetry there. I think they can make it uncomfortable for parents. Um, I think parents need to um, kind of grow a spine and fight back because they're getting bullied bad and it's not working out well for anyone. Yeah, I think clearly we, we, normal parents outnumber these people. It's just that we haven't been showing up. Well, I think a part of it, too, though, is that it's it's – what usually rises in in the PTA structure are and you you call, I love this line in your article where you talk about that you know that parents have been relegated to the role of cheerleaders and paraphrasing there but you talk about how you know it's they're not just you know bakers and casserole makers they're cheerleaders that is all they're allowed to be and that's why when I complained about uh, about the teacher walkout and you know I I sort of posted the picture on Twitter under my own I didn't you know I didn't say like julie pta member post this i just did it under my own bar. but that was i mean they were horrified that i did that that i showed any sort of criticism or expressed any criticism towards the pta yeah i mean we can just never forget again that p- parents and teachers do not have the same interests at all um and they I, just simply cannot be a group that is both parents and teachers and, and that purports to be to, to do anything meaningful um we we can't be teachers lapdogs um and, you know, the, basically in Fairfax County, Virginia, the, you know, which is kind of made national news because the teachers union didn't want to go back even after teachers right. were vaccinated. Well, Kimberly Adams, the union president, she was a union president a few years ago, and then she was countywide PTA president, and then she went back to being teachers union president. Good grief. Um, and it is because of the umbrella structure. You know, these yeah. activists are really good at infiltrating the little umbrellas because yeah. normal parents are like, I'm going to get involved in my specific school. It's, right. it's usually activists that go to these umbrella nodes that can exert a lot of influence, but that most people don't really care about. Um, so the idea that a, the teachers union president would be in charge of the countywide PTA of the 10th mm. biggest school system in the country, uh, you know, that's kind of on us as parents. It's a, it's a completely insane situation. Yeah. Um, and if, if we don't want this kind of thing to happen again, we can never let that kind of thing happen again. Well, listen, Luke, you are an av- I'm so glad you're out there reporting on this. Um, I encourage everyone to go to the Daily Wire and check out Luke's reporting um, and also go to whataretheylearning.com because you will learn a lot. You'll probably cry. You might cry a little because <laughs> you what you learn about your school district uh, won't be that nice. But Luke, I can't thank you enough. Is there anything, uh, you know, if you do you want to tell people your Twitter handle or any other way to sort of read your your stuff? Uh, I'm on Twitter with my name, Luke Reziak, and yeah, do check out the Daily Wire. We've got a new investigative team, so we're going to be doing uh, hopefully a lot of this kind of work in the future. Well, Luke, I don't see a huge future for you with your local PTA. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're. I think you're pre-fired. You can join. You and I can like. We can be like the p- people that were fired from. But I think you've been pre-fired. You're like on a file. You're in a file. Do not let this guy anywhere near the PTA. Uh, so, but I do wish you luck once your children start school. It is quite a ride. And I, again, I'm I'm thrilled that you're out there. I think you're a real asset to parents. And and I hope more people read your report. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. So it was great talking to Luke. Um, He certainly um, paints a sort of depressing picture of the national PTA. But I think it's important also to say that some PTAs are pretty great. 
and are probably uh, voicing some, maybe a little bit of opposition to the closed school, the continuation of closed schools, or um, maybe some of, uh, you know, sort of the activist um, or the advocacy they're being pressured. Maybe, maybe, you know, some of these PTAs just aren't doing those things and really are going beyond the sort of bake sales. And I'm sure there are some that are, are, trying to get involved in things like curriculum issues or ensuring that politics are, are kept out of school or s- some of the more divisive issues are kept away from children. And that's great. And so I, you know, I, I want to be sure to, to say that, you know, there, there are good PTAs out there, but it's important to know that the PTA organization, the national organization that really sets the agenda and sets the rules and says what PTAs are going to advocate for and what they're going to stand for needs some reform, needs a lot of reform. And as Luke said, it might just be better to get rid of it altogether. I don't know what the solution is, but I do know that one thing that is going to happen after the coronavirus has sort of left, left us and everyone's vaccinated and we're back to normal, um, people aren't going to sit back as easily anymore. These grassroots organizations that have cropped up all over the country and have really replaced the PTAs in many cases are still going to be there. And I think that is the future of parents advocating for their children in the schools. So if you have an open schools organization, you might look to them rather than the PTAs going forward, because I think they more are doing a better job of reflecting the concerns of of local parents. Thanks everyone for being here for another episode of the Bespoke Parenting Hour. If you enjoyed this episode or like the podcast in general, please leave a rating or review on iTunes. This helps ensure that the podcast reaches as many listeners as possible. If you haven't subscribed to the Bespoke Parenting Hour on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts, please do so so you won't miss an episode. Don't forget to share this episode and let your friends know that they can get bespoke episodes on their favorite podcast app. From all of us here at the Independent Women's Forum, thanks for listening.